Noel Phelps was the sixth grand uncle of Letha Rose Lutz. He was a Yale University graduate, justice of the peace, judge of probate for 20 years, and was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention of 1787 to ratify the federal constitution. At his own expense, he raised the company of militia during the revolution. As a captain, he served under Colonel Ward and saw action at Fort Lee before joining George Washington's army when he fought at the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Now we're going to tell a little bit how, um, how important he was for the Revolutionary War. Even before shooting started in the American Revolutionary War, the American patriots were concerned about Fort Ponderoga. Within its walls was a collection of heavy artillery, including cannons, howitzers, and mortars, armaments that the Americans had in short supply. The fort was situated on the shores of Lake Champlain, a strategically important route between the 13 colonies and the British-controlled northern provinces. After the war began with the battles of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, the British General Thomas Gage realized that the fort would require fortification and several colonists had the idea of capturing the fort. Captain Noah Phelps, as a spy, gathered key intelligence in preparation for, taking a, for the taking of the fort. Near the fort, he stopped overnight at a farmhouse. Some British soldiers occupied rooms adjoining Phelps. Phelps heard them discuss the condition of the fort and position taken by the rebels. Early the next morning, Phelps gained entrance to the fort disguised as a peddler, seeking a shave. As a peddler, he avoided suspicion and had opportunity to ascertain, ascertain the construction, strength, and force of the garrison. While returning through the fort, the commander accompanied him, talking with him about the rebels, their object, and their objects, objectives and movements. Phelps, upon seeing a portion of the exterior wall in a dilapidated condition, remarked that it would afford a feeble defense against the rebels if they should attack at that quarter. The commander replied, Yes, but that's not our greatest misfortune. Our powder is damaged, and before we can use it, we're obliged to dry and sift it. Phelps soon after left the fort hiring a boatman. He requested the boatman to row it hard that he might determine, terminate the journey as soon as possible. The boatman re then requested him to take an oar and assist. Phelps declined to do so, being in full sight of the fort by saying, I'm no boatman. After rounding a point the block that blocked, the view from, blocked their view from the fort, Phelps quickly took up an oar and began a strong, being a strong active man, as well as a good oarsman. And the, and the other oarsman said, you have an oar, you, you have seen an oar before now, sir. Captain Phelps reported the intelligence he had gained to General Ethan Allen. The information he had gathered enabled the attacking force to plan a surprise dawn raid that resulted in the bloodless taking the fort. As dawn approached, Allen and Arnold became fearful of losing the element of surprise, so they decided to attack with the men at hand. The only sentry on duty at the south gate fled his post after his musket misfired and the Americans rushed onto the fort. The Patriots then roused a small number of sleeping troops at gunpoint and began confiscating the weapons. Allen and Arnold and a few other men charged up the stairs toward the officers' quarters. Lieutenant Jocelyn Feltman was awakened by the noise and demanded to know by what authority the fort was being entered. Allen replied, In the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Nobody was killed in the battle. The only injury was to one American who was slightly injured by a sentry with a bayonet. The capture of Fort Ticonderoga occurred on May 10, 1975, when a small force of Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen and Colonel Benedict Arnold, surprised and captured the fort's small British garrison. The cannons and other armaments of Fort Ticonderoga were later transported to Boston by Colonel Henry Knox and the noble train of um, artillery and used to fortify Dorchester Heights and break the standoff of the Siege of Boston. The capture of this capture of the fort marked the beginning of an offensive action taken by the Americans against the British. A little bit about Phelps. Um, 
He remained in Connecticut for his whole life. So here you see the Phelps House and Tavern. It was owned by five generations of the Phelps family for nearly 200 years. The building served as a family home, canal hotel, lodge meeting site, entertainment hall, and local tavern. From 1786 until 1849, three generations of fathers and sons and one widow served as tavern keeper. It was built for Elisha Phelps in 1771. The house may include part of an earlier dwelling uh, constructed by his father in 1761. The building was family residence until Noah Phelps, Noah Phelps, Captain Phelps, Elisha Phelps' brother, acquired the first tavern license in 1786. Then his son, Noah Phelps, ran the tavern from 1805 to 1817. Then his widow, Charlotte, operated the tavern herself until her son, Jeffrey Phelps, purchased property in 1820. And then Jeffrey Phelps ran the tavern for 24, 29 more years. A tavern back in that time was more than just a bar. The tavern was a place of getting food and a place for lodging. So it was basically like a hotel slash restaurant. Um, this still stands in Connecticut. It was given as a gift to the Simsbury Historical Society in 1962 by Mary Phelps. And what a history our Captain um, Phelps and the rest of his family has for our country.